So I would expect the season on the pitch to go the way that these things always do. They will start well. They will have a slight dip over the course of maybe 135 minutes of soccer in early October. <laughs> and people will say, well, are City the same? Oh, maybe they're not the same. Maybe, maybe, it's, you know, maybe it's one step too far. And then between February and May, they will win 19 <laughs> games in a row and no one will be able to live with them. That's how it will play out on the pitch. It's back. With its delicious 380 games scattered over 281 days, starting this very Friday, the 2024-25 Premier League is upon us. It's like the world's most bling-bling ultra-marathon in which all of us get runners nipple. And I just adore this week, the run-up to kick-off. Because honestly, right now, no matter what team you support, we are all filled with hope that the new Irish centre-back we plucked from below the radar is going to be full on USS Enterprise deflector shields. In the words of Emily Dickinson, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Emily Dickinson would probably have been proper Aston Villa. So on this day, as it is any other day, it is, I will say though, even more so Premier League Eve, a joy to say hello to a bloke who spent much of his summer in Paris, where I believe he's gone the full-on Neil Mopé, bonjour to the New York Times soccer king, oh, Monsieur Rory Smith. Sadly, football is in my past now, Rog. I am, I'm only table tennis. That's what the Olympics taught me, the, the sport of the future. It's tennis, but it's zoomed down so it's the size of a table. Yeah, you are now, you told me, a table tennis ultra. I did meet some table, table tennis ultras. You know me, I love, I love an ultra culture, and it turns, it turns out they do have them in table tennis. I just, of all the sports at the Olympics that I thought would not be good to watch live, table tennis was second behind fencing. Turns out fencing isn't good to watch live. Nobody has a clue what's going on, including the people who are fencing. Uh, but table tennis is brilliant in the flesh, and I would genuinely, sincerely regardless of kind of English accent making it sound like pretty much everything I say is sarcastic, uh, encourage you to go and watch high-level table tennis. It's it's absolutely enthralling. Chelsea coming in for Felix Lebrun for $100 million. <laughs> Here we go. That is the future. Um, I've actually spent the last week charging around, not Paris, where it has felt like the whole of the world is. I've been in Britain hoovering up English breakfast on the daily, laying waste to pie after pie inhaling every single curry that I can find and filming with so many of the Premier League characters who are going to shape our next eight months. We have interviews, by the way, going up every day on our YouTube. I think Son Hung Min, really beautiful piece, um, is about to go live today. I've interviewed him a ton of times, um, but never in person. And no one was more excited. He said, like, you've come 3,000 miles to interview me? as if he's like some unknown footballer that I've schlepped across the Atlantic to be with. A truly beautiful bloke. Spent the day um, at Arsenal filming with Mikel Arteta and Martin Odegaard. Neither man can wait for the season to win. They hungry. Um, Raw, how excited are you for all is to come as we pod Premier League just three sleeps away? I realise, strictly speaking, I should say that I'm, I'm kind of breathless with anticipation. I still have a little bit of kind of post-Olympics afterglow. Paris was a great place to be for two weeks. Uh, but then I can feel myself being being sort of dragged to the Premier League. And occasionally you'll see something or you'll think of a fixture. Or, you know, occasionally the, the clouds will break over Yorkshire and it'll be sunny. And I love football in the sunshine. I really love football in the sunshine when it's really bright and the green is really green. Um, and you feel yourself, you know what's going to happen. You're, you're going to be all cynical and a bit kind of, oh, I don't know if I've got the energy for this, right up until about 7.48pm on Friday night. And you'll be like, there's a football match on the telly. I think I might watch that. Just when I thought I was out, they dragged me back in. And by that, I mean for the next eight months. Um, and we're going to break down everything. Um, that you need to know, dear Premier League fans, to be ready uh, for the season ahead. Uh, we are going to make uh, our predictions after charging through the title contenders, touching on the middle, probing through the bowels, the anals of the Premier League, 
Um, and we'll end by making our predictions for the winners and the losers or what my dad, Judge Iver, insisted on calling the not winners, Everton, chief amongst them. But I do want to begin by raising my uh, third first Michelob Ultra of the night to, to sing as I'm in England, in London, as we pod to a great Londoner, Emma Hayes, the best of British, um, who has made us all feel so bloody proud and joyous again to be American. Uh, both of the elite transformations she's overseen in just 72 days from the first training to gold medal game. Um, I don't know about you, listeners, but in this time of chaos, um, I've been with with a real pride when I hear Emma, North London, through and through, talk about her love of America, uh, which is an echo of mine. Um, her quote, America made me. Um, and she's a winner, very much a winner. It's her whole identity. And as an English manager, um, that's a very rare thing to feel that you are a winner. Indeed, an English football figure with that kind of unshakable confidence that she speaks about, also utter belief, um, is very rare. It's a new archetype. Jude Bellingham is really the only other English football figure I can think of who embodies it currently. So I just say to Emma Hayes, um, as the US men's search for coaches goes on, can I just acknowledge how high a bar US soccer have set for themselves with Emma? Really the female equivalent of Jurgen Klopp coming to coach us to more and all that is to come. What's it been like for you uh, watching Emma Hayes ride with us from afar? Do you have buyer's remorse? Is it seller's remorse? Is it? I don't know. I, I was intrigued because I, I went to Emma Hayes' last game in charge of Chelsea and she talked really kind of passionately about about the drain of of managing a, a club day to day, about the scrutiny that she was working under, about the pressure she was under. And she did she kinda said, not verbatim, but like the, 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 the spirit of her words was very much, I'm looking forward to kind of taking a break. And it she didn't mean like a temporal break because she, she I think she was flying to the States I think the th- maybe the Monday it was a, the game happened on a Saturday and she, she either the Monday or the Tuesday she was flying out and that's not like four days isn't isn't a break is it it's not kind of I've I've been working here for twelve years I just need four days off and I'll be fine um, it was I think she wanted the kind of the change of pace of international soccer and I think that that was true but when she said it I kind of thought Emma I feel like you're maybe underestimating quite how much scrutiny comes with the biggest job in in women's soccer. And to be honest, one of the biggest soccer jobs in the world, without a shadow of a doubt, any gender at all. Um, There's intense pressure, both internal and external, on that job. And I did worry, for all her achievements, that maybe she wasn't quite walking into something with her eyes open, if you know what I mean. Um... What's become clear since then is is the attachment she feels for the US, the the like the appreciation and the gratitude she has to to soccer in the US, uh, but also how quickly she can re-energize herself, but but implement her methods, claim loyalty from players who a group of players who are not necessarily easily convinced. Is that fair to describe the US women's na- national team? That feels like a a diplomatic way of putting it. You have to kind of win them over. It's not an easy, not an easy bunch to coach, I would say, um, and she's done it really quickly. She needed the gold medal. I think anything else would have been a really problematic start and a very delicate moment for her. And there were a couple of stairs along the way in in not just Paris, but kind of Paris, Marseille, Bordeaux, wherever else they played. Um, it's the perfect start for her, and it should be the the ideal building block where you take a team that still has quite a lot of the best players in the world and one of the best managers in the world. That should work, but it needed to get off to a good start. Amen. Roar from your English mouth oh, to an American God's ear. Let us dive in now to the Premier League. We have so much football to get through. Let's start at the top oh, with Manchester City. Question as we sit here is, can that historic four-peat become a five-peat? Is that even a thing? I guess the answer is, do bears crap in the woods this season? Which may... Maybe Pep Guardiola's last. His contract runs out. He's yet to renew. He's a top edge of Pep. May also be Kevin De Bruyne's final giddy up at Manchester City. Man still searching for a signature hairstyle at 33 years of age, which is a thing. Um, but the dual storyline of the season that's dominant will be this. Um, the Manchester City are going to battle all comers on the field as they do while they finally face up uh, to the reckoning 
uh, of the 115 charges that have been leveled against them for breaches of financial rules by the very Premier League uh, who own the trophy that they keep winning. Um, we learned this week the hearing will finally begin in September with the outcome of the case, which the tabloids keep referring to over here as box office as early as January. I think this season's going to feel very much like a football journey. Um Running alongside a court procedural, it's like Friday Night Lights and Suits having the crossover that no one's been crying out for. Rory, Pep's constantly found ways to to circle the Raggins and, and grapple against City's greatest opponent, which honestly I believe to be complacency. Do you expect the, the grinding gauntlet that's the legal case to be a massive distraction? Is it going to give this title defence really an unprecedented counter-narrative? They've shown an amazing ability to separate the two things over the last year particularly, but probably two or three, that they will occasionally kind of acknowledge this very false siege mentality, the kind of the world is a, is a raid against us, that isn't it difficult being Man City, you know, all the haters out there, and you think, well, look, you've got basically every possible advantage known to man, <laughs> and they're just the ones you're allowed. That There might also have been a load of other advantages that you're not allowed. Like, you are not the underdogs here, you are not, you're not kind of Millwall, but with Erling Haaland up front, that that's not a thing. But they have created that impression. Certainly, it, they've projected that impression. I don't, know, I don't know to what extent the players believe it. I don't know whether internally that's a thing that really applies, because it does feel quite false from the outside. So I would expect the season on the pitch to go the way that these things always do. They will start well. They will have a slight dip over the course of maybe ooh, 135 minutes of soccer in early October, <laughs> and people will say, "Well, are City the same? Oh, maybe they're not the same. Maybe, maybe it's you know, maybe it's one step too far." And then between February and May, they will win 19 <sighs> games in a row, and no one will be able to live with them. That's how it will play out on the pitch, uh, which is testament. And I think this is really important. These two things can be true at the same time. It's in, in what Guardiola has done with that team to maintain the the hunger to stave off the complacency, as you say, is incredible and can be admired separate from all the other stuff around Manchester City. The, I guess the complication comes if that legal case starts in September, ends a few weeks later, if the verdict is delivered in January, if it is not in City's favour, there will be an appeal. If that appeal comes before the end of the season and there is some sort of punishment, I think that's the point where you wonder if there's a there's a reckoning coming for City. But look, to be honest, parking what what it looks like from the outside, this will come down to the legalities involved. And, you know, we saw with the UEFA one that a lot of the charges, not all of them, but a lot of them were sort of exceeded the statute of limitations. And so you spend all of this time, all this energy, all this money trying to establish, you know, have City done this, have City done that? And ultimately, the answer in, in a, at least a few of those cases was it doesn't really matter because it was too long ago. This is a legal process. It will depend to an extent on the legal interpretation. There will be no definitive answer. There will be no... The Premier League won't come out and say we are completely satisfied that Manchester City were completely above board if City are found innocent, just as if City are found guilty... Sheikh Mansour is not going to do a video saying, mm, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Neither thing will happen. There will be no closure in that sense. But you do wonder if there is a kind of, there's a point at the end of the season where maybe we we can move on from this element of the story. Although having said that, not that likely. Why do I feel like that the end of all of this 115 charge investigation, um, it's all just going to end with Everton somehow being docked nine points. Um this promises to be a City campaign in which old meets new. And I mean, absolutely. I mentioned Kevin De Bruyne, 33 years of age. Carl Walker, 34. Bernardo Silva, he's getting on. Um, Harlan's backup, the electrically clinical uh, Julian Alvarez has just moved to Atletico Madrid in a deal worth $105 million City record sale. A big incomer, 20-year-old newcomer, Brazilian wide wizard Savinho. Uh, who's moved from Troy via Girona, uh, both clubs within City's football group network, doing exactly what it says it was meant to do on the very expensive tin. He'll join a ton of City prospects who showed their quality this preseason. We knew about 21-year-old Oscar Bob, 21-year-old James McAtee, 19-year-old senior debutant Nico O'Reilly, 
uh, who's been at the club since he was eight. Um, I think together their combined age is, is still younger than James Milner. But Pep has talked a lot about just how tired his senior players are. Henry Winter, the English journalist, worked out that some of City's players have just finished 344-day seasons, which is insane. Um, what's fascinating, Rodri remains City's everything. Um, and there's so little raw by way of replacement for him. He's the soul. He's the heartbeat of the team. Um, if he experiences serious injury, dot, dot, dot. That's the, that's the big, the big kind of question mark is if, if Rodri was missing for any, any substantial period of time, would City be the same? Ideally, you don't have to find out because I think the Premier League with Rodri in it is a better place than the Premier League without Rodri in it. Uh, but that said, I think in big games, look, you wouldn't want to lose Rodri for a Champions League semi-final second leg in Madrid. That would be bad. I think you can probably lose Rodri for Bournemouth away and be okay. Uh, so it, I don't know if, if losing Rodri over the course of the season, if he missed, a, say, I don't know, three months at some point, I don't know if that would cost them the lead necessarily. I, it would depend on the fixtures a little bit. The, the one thing about City that's kind of misunderstood, I think, and has been misunderstood for a while, their squad's not that deep. It's extremely high quality. It's much more high quality than anybody else's in terms of the players that they can, they can use as substitutes. That they have, they, you know, they kind of sat on Jack Grealish for six months last season. He was just kind of there, this hundred million pound signing. Nobody, nobody else can do that. Nobody else would dare to do that. Partly that's financial. Partly that's just of Pep's kind of power. Um, but it's not that deep. And yes, Savio comes in and adds another wide element. You expect a bit more from Doku. I am sure they will replace Alvarez. They will they will not go into this season with with just a sort of smattering of, of wide players and number tens and then Erling Haaland as their only striker. I'm pretty sure that's not that's not what's gonna happen. I'd expect them to sign another midfielder. They have the firepower. They sold Alvarez for a lot of money. That's a really big fee for Julian Alvarez. They obviously have, have the financial ability to do whatever they like. I think City will look stronger at the end of August than they do now. But the one thing that I'd, I'd maybe say at the moment is that squad looks quite thin because there's a couple, someone like Mateus Nunes, who was signed last summer, didn't really contribute. And it is possible there's plenty of people who have kind of had a second season under Guardiola and really thrived. But they don't all do that. And if that's what City are relying on, yeah, you kind of need your big guns to stay fit. And that's always a slightly risky proposition. I can get you Beto for about 80 million to Arsenal Rory club that I spent the day at today. Um, second place the last two seasons, last campaign, more points than any Arsenal club since the Invincibles, but still two points short of artificial intelligences. Manchester City is this a year they summon all the good vibes, all the promise, all of the yearning and complete that epic Greek poem of a hero's journey, or does it all just turn out to be an epic Greek tragic lament? That's really the question. Last season, 35 wins in 52 games, no trophies. Um, the big name arriving at the squad is a quite extremely handsome Italian Riccardo Fiori, versatile left back with a specific set of skills uh, who can help Arsenal have a dual flank threat to match the one on the right with Ben White and Saka. Um, centre-back Jurian Timber, Everyone be like, oh, he'd be like a new signing. You have the the impact really that was desired last season before he cruelly went down on his debut of an ACL injury. Um, it's going to be very interesting to look at this Arsenal squad in total. Uh, when Arteta took over initially, squad was filled with DNA straight from the academy: Saka, Smith Rowe, Joe Willock, Maitland Niles, Eddie and Ketcher. Um, almost all of those players, bar Saka, gone or on the bubble. Much more global squad now. I actually spoke to um, Arteta about that point today. He said he's realised exactly what it needs to go to the next level. Um, Erdegaard, the midfield wizard, the post-game photographer, talked about the feeling of needing to be perfect. Um, and what's funny to me about the squad, we got a lot of great Arsenal questions that came in via our text line. Um, as Arsenal continue to sign extremely handsome players, um, one of the questions was, are we on the verge of a Zoolander-esque feud that could tank the dressing room? Just love that idea. Um, we don't have time on this show to philosophize on this question, but tell us your name next, mystery texter. Um, can also actually beat Man City? This is another text. 
without signing a top tier striker raw. Surely Kai and Jesus um, says, says the texter are amazing. Aren't quite enough though. If you fail last season and do not change anything up front, how can you succeed? Yeah, it does feel to me that I mean, Yuri and Timber, I think, will be really important for Arsenal this this season. And and I think Calafiori, Calafiori is really a smart is a really smart kind of astute addition. They don't strike me as being the sort of players who massively increase your points tallies. I don't think that's the difference between a, a ninety point season and a ninety five point season. A goal scorer, a truly top class number nine might be. And you do wonder if that's the one thing that Arsenal are missing. And that's it's not a it's not a plug and play thing. You know, if you don't sign Victor Osimen, then you and you play him, obviously, you then lose certain elements of the movement that Havertz or, or Jesus provide you. That influences the team, that impacts the way that everybody else plays, changes the structure, it might make you less effective. But it it I don't I look at Arsenal squad and think you are better than last year. And just as last season I looked at Arsenal squad and thought you are better than the year before. You look at Arsenal's growth through last season, up to and including that um, that draw at the Etihad. They beat City at, at at the Emirates. There was there were kind of quite a lot of signal results that said, "Okay, Arsenal are now here, and they are serious." Being Liverpool, being Man United, but I don't look at them and think you can overtake Manchester City, even even with unless I mean if City have an injury crisis and their thin squad comes back to haunt them, then maybe. But it looks to me like as things stand now a few days before the season starts, Manchester City have the agency. It's up to them whether they win the league. I don't th- look at Arsenal and think you can get the number of points you need to to see off City unless something happens to City. Something like 115 charges. Who knows? Erdegaard, as I said, in an interview which will come out, I think, Thursday, um, Arsenal have to be perfect. They're very aware of this to win. Essentially, to beat um, man versus machine style Manchester City, that's what it's going to take. Will they do it according to Rora and me or will be revealed when we make our Premier League predictions at the end of the show from Arsenal? Where I was today, and yes, I did meet Win the Dog, and yes, I was starstruck to the club I was at yesterday, Liverpool Football Club. Yeah, I was behind enemy lines uh, at a remarkable time of transition as Liverpool prepared to start a season without Jurgen Klopp as their manager for the first time since 2015-16. In comes Arne Slot. He arrived in May, the gent who won the Eredivisie title and the Dutch Cup in his two seasons with Feyenoord and is now one of a vast influx of bald managers who will be on the sideline of the Premier League this season, bald as ever, is the new orange. Um, There's been a lot of talk from the players about new tactics, squad players, quote, happier than we've ever been. Virgil van Dijk in an interview, which comes out Thursday the 22nd, talked to me about the slot playing style, um, which is more caring in possession, less chaotic, more patient. Um, And the poet known as Harvey Elliott, he was asked how slots tactics uh, compare to Klopp's heavy metal football. And he said, It's very elegant, Dutch style, which I love, Dutch style. He said it's very nice, which honestly made the whole thing sound like some kind of chilled out Tiesto set. Raw, give us a blast on this new character, Arne, how he'll change what we know and what we should expect about Liverpool's title challenge. I think people will quite like Arne Slot, obviously with the asterisk that he's the manager of Liverpool, so quite a lot of people are predisposed to hating him and everything he does and says and stands for. I think he's a he's a good communicator. He's got a very clear, a sort of clear idea of how he wants to play. It will be different to what Liverpool were under Klopp, not better, not worse. Uh, well, I mean, probably a bit worse than the you know the highlight of Klopp's time at Liverpool, just because that was a kind of historically good team. But I think it's probably a necessary transition. There were times in what the last two three years of Klopp when watching Liverpool wasn't easy. When you did want them to have more control, I think certain players, Elliot prime amongst them will really benefit from that approach. I think there's an edge for Liverpool in that I think they probably become not predictable, but I think people knew what was coming from Klopp's Liverpool and were at least forewarned about it, if not forearmed, that you know they still won most of their games. They were still one of the best teams in in the country and in the world. But you kind of knew how they were going to try and beat you, and that's a disadvantage. With slot, there is a little bit more of an X factor, a little bit of uncertainty. Liverpool probably need that 
as a as a competitive weapon, but also maybe for the fans who who aren't going to turn up and feel like they know what's coming every week. Um, I don't think Liverpool will, will win the league this season. I don't think they'll get particularly close to winning the league this season, but that shouldn't matter because I suspect what Liverpool are thinking internally is that the 2026 Premier League title is probably a lot more attainable than, than the 2025 edition. You've got three players in in Salah, Trent, Trent Alexander-Arnold and, and Virgil van Dijk whose contracts are up at the end of next season. They need to sort that out. Load of young players that are, are still bedding in. You want to see what they can become. You've got a manager who needs more than a few months, a few weeks to cast his eye over the squad. This is a learning season for Liverpool. They won't. That doesn't mean they'll, they'll be short of ambition particularly and they'll want to see progress. But I think Liverpool will be looking at this season not thinking, you know, we've seen it with the, you know, it, the Martin Zubimendi deal, which which fell apart on Monday night. That felt like a real blow. But at the same time, you can see why Liverpool aren't thinking we have to go and spend 70 million quid on somebody else just because we need a number six. Because there's a lot, there's a lot of kind of questions over different players. There's a lot of questions to answer at Liverpool. And it'll take time. This is not, this is a season that will have its ups and downs. I think they accept that. They know that. They are inevitable. Um, it, it's one where you want to see signs of progress. It's not the, it's not the destination in itself. That's very fascinating. I, you know, I can imagine FSG, Fenway Sports Group, you know, thinking about this being a rebuilding year. Um, but the idea of a rebuilding year in football, English football particularly, has always been an anathema. It's one of the things that was most, uh, you know, took time to adjust for me. Uh, moving to America, where fans are, uh, I think, savvier about the the waxing and waning of club builds and rebuilds, and the, they will still buy a season ticket if the if the coach is saying, "Yeah, this is a rebuilding year." You never hear that in English football, but that's very much what it feels like for Liverpool Football Club. Um, uh, Zubamendi, you mentioned Real Sociedad midfield ace. Um, did reject the move, which means Liverpool are the only Premier League club yet to make a summer signing. Stark contrast to this time last year when they got their business done early and often. Um, I do believe Liverpool will go as Darwin Nunez goes, a bit like Ohio in a presidential election. Um, that's what Nunez is for this season. Slot has got to get the 25-year-old feeling so much happier than we last saw him in a Liverpool jersey. He started just one of the last seven games of the Klopp reign. Um, we saw him under Bielsa thriving in the Copa America. There is a deeply explosive talent there, but it is so unbelievably mercurial. And talking of explosive talent, let us marvel for a second together at Aston Villa, Champions League Villa. I will say England's a particularly fractious, angry nation right now, um, but few people seem happier in the world to me. Um, than the Villa fans I've met this week across Britain. Villa under Unai Emery, first better, now younger. Uh, Ian Matson um, and beautiful, beautiful Amadou Nana, uh, once of Everton, so good when he actually tries, as he will for Villa. Join a slew of new raw talent, including Cameron Archer, Jaden Philogene, Samuel Illing Jr., Lewis Dobbin, Enzo Baranchier. All 23 or younger, along with old man, old friend, Ross Barkley, all will be somehow edged into the spaces that John McGinn's enormous buttocks leave on the field. Huge pressure on Ollie Watkins and Emmy Martinez at either end of the field to stay fit and on form. Those gents are irreplaceable. Raw, do we expect the double front battle of Premier League and a first in a long time Champions League gauntlet to distract and divert energies, almost as they did for Newcastle last season? Yeah, although I, th- I think the, the impact won't be as pronounced. It might depend a little bit on, on who they end up playing in the Champions League, obviously different Champions League format this season. They have a deeper squad now. I think that's true. They have a younger squad, which is good. They've made some really good signings. Matson is such a good signing. It just a perfect transfer and almost one of those where you kind of want to stand up and applaud and say that's what <laughs> kind of transfers should be. Philogene's done really well in the championship. He um, he was, there was quite a lot of teams around Europe after him. That's a bit of a coup for Villa. Illing Jr. is not really shone at Juventus, but he's got a really good reputation, clearly very gifted. I think they've, Anana is, in, Anana's smart. It's a smart deal. It's a, a weird period at the end of June, start of July when, Lots of transfers happen between three or four different clubs and you sort of thought, mm, I'm not quite sure why all of these things are happening all at once. It seems slightly odd. 
Uh, but that is Anana's a proven campaigner. He's a high quality player. He gives them a threat. So they have the depth. They have the youth. They've got a great manager. They've got a top class striker in, in Ollie Watkins. They've got a real character as a, as a team. They've got a stadium that will be vociferous and boisterous, especially in, in Europe, just for the joy of being there. It's a it's a wonderful time to be a Villa fan. I don't think they will go deep in the Champions League. I think ideally for Unai Emery, they'd get knocked out and play in the Europa League, but I'm not sure that's possible anymore, which is a bit of a drawback. Um, <laughs> but this, I think it will be a positive campaign for Villa because they've they've re- they've t- gone from a position of strength and they've recruited really well. Let's talk about another Champions League aspirant this season. Oh, Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, Another club bringing in a glut of young, young talent, including the signing of South Korean teenage winger Yang Min Hyuk from Gangwon in a deal that will see the player arrive in January. He's been called the next Sonny, uh, which when I talk to the real Sonny, um, present day Sonny, about already being replaced in name anyway, um, made my interview feel a bit like a trip to the therapist couch for a mo. That interview with Sonny, I think it went up on our YouTube today. It's really beautiful. Uh, Archie Gray, the 18-year-old sorcerer's apprentice of a midfielder, also arrived from Leeds last season. Remember, Spurs exploded out the blocks. They were undefeated um, in their first 10 games. Big Ange looked like an absolute genius. But then the plummet. Injuries, ill-discipline, being found out tactically and having no evident plan B, or, or, or worse, being too stubborn tactically. Uh, and so open, vulnerable defensively, depending on who you ask, did them in. Um, I did spend time with Ange last week. Caveat, I'm very, very fond of Ange as a human being. Um, to be honest, he did seem like a slightly different figure than the man I met this time last season. Definitely a gent grappling uh, with the uncompromising, unrelenting, grinding reality of the top flight English football that he idolised as a kid from a world away in Australia. Um, honestly, I'll be candid, it's unclear to me how much of Spurs' problems are about the managerial philosophy, how much are about the big vision of the club, as they have been for so long. Um, apart from Mauricio Pochettino, who honestly, to me, performed alchemy during five seasons uh, at Tottenham Hotspur, Raw, every single manager has lasted at most a season and a half in the last 12 years. That's an incredible statistic. 12 years of football and bar Poch, Everyone else has failed to last more than a season and a half. Kind of suggests, if you look at that, Ange's time may be limited unless his learning curve is sharp. How do you understand where the problem lies at? I think, yeah, I know what you mean. It's it's partly to do with whether there is a real vision of what Spurs want to be. But to me, po- Poster Codlu kind of, he, it's the right club for a manager like him. He's, he's likeable, which is important. Because they're not going to win every trophy under the sun. They're not going to be do a Man City and rack up ninety seven points or whatever. They're going to have games where they get beaten and probably beaten quite heavily. To be perfectly honest, uh, he plays an attractive style of football, which is what the fans want. He gives young players a chance, which is what the fans want. He makes Spurs interesting, which is what all fans want for their club. They want their, they want their team to be interesting. He gives fans something to kind of believe in Spurs stand for something other than winning football matches and if you can't win all the football matches then you need to stand for something other than winning football matches I think it I think it works to be honest and if you look for all the legitimate criticism of Daniel Levy in particular and Spurs' kind of strategy in the transfer market they've spent about what 120 million dollars this summer they've signed not just not just Jan but Lutas Birdval the Swedish midfielder again 18 year old 19 year old incredibly promising They've um, they've tied Mikey Moore, who is the gem of their academy, to a long term contract. They've spent sixty four, sixty five million dollars on Dominic Solanke, which some would say is too many dollars to spend on a Dominic Solanke. But at the same time, you know, proper number nines are really rare, and he scored a lot of goals last season. So that that's what you've got to do. And then I genuinely believe, with a slight Yorkshire bias, having seen. Archie Gray's dad make his debut for Leeds. Um, I think a lot of people are going to be surprised by how by how good Archie Gray is. Archie Gray is a really talented footballer, and that was a really smart signing. In a way, Spurs are like Chelsea, but smart. Chelsea with a brain, um, and Godspeed to them. Uh, I so want. I've got to say, Tottenham too. I want Ange um, to soar in the face. 
um, of those who doubt him, no, not for footballing reasons, for life reasons, to be candid. Uh, but it's time to talk about two massive clubs in transition. Some would say clubs who fall into a cycle of perpetual transition. Um, Manchester United first. United, uh, the Castle Harren Hall of English football, um, a brand beloved because of legacy and old times. Um and also because people love rubbernecking. And so we enter the new era of minority controlling owner, Sir Jim Ratcliffe, a man who talks about high performance and cost cutting with equal measure. He's trying to bring in a new energy and new culture and new momentum into a club uh, for whom that hole in the roof at Old Trafford has become a symbol of pretty well everything that sunk them uh, under the Glazer ownership. Eighth place last season, a cavernous 31 points behind Manchester City. FA Cup winners. Yes, I know they won that tchotchke. Um, Ratcliffe, God bless him, sniffed around and winked at just about every single available manager in world football before sticking uh, with a quite tortured Eric Ten Hag. Um, he's brought in a new defender, um, Matej Dilek and Nusser Mazrui from Bayern Munich for a combined fee. Uh, of more than $65 million. Deals for De Ligt and Masruai, both who played under Eric Ten Hag when he was at Ajax, were agreed over the weekend. Um, that means United have now spent $298 million bringing five of Ten Hag's former Ajax players to Old Trafford in just the last two years. Dude's getting the band back together. Um, but that old United foe has already kicked in. They suffered 60-plus injuries last season, which is astonishing they already have an almost an entire defensive unit undermined by various maladies including seeing 67 million dollar new boy Lenny Yoro out for three months after foot surgery Australian singer Shaw Mills body double Rasmus Hoyland out for the first few weeks young Dutch attacking sensation Joshua Zerke has arrived can't wait to watch him step up after a quite a bullion season at Bologna um, but goals continue to be United's bet noir uh, with prime objective to have returning hero Rude van Nisselrooy, one of the new assistant coaches for Ten Hag, brief confidence and clinicality back into Marcus Rashford. And Rory, I don't know if you can truly coach the goals. Um, question via our Insta broadcast channel at B Jengles. Um, does Ten Hag make it the full season? Huh, that's a good question, isn't it? Because it's been a weird summer for Manchester United. It's been a really weird summer. So they start off, as you say, interviewing all the managers in Europe. They have this process where they're trying to replace Ten Hag, then decide they don't want to, which kind of strengthens his position while simultaneously massively undermining it. Then you get Jim Ratcliffe talking about um, kind of culture and changing the way they work and bringing all these executives and this guy's the best recruitment guy and this is the the chief executive we need and... They're all really smart appointments, and then they end up spending quite a lot of money on money on two fellas the manager knows, and you think, well, that's kind of what you were doing before. That's weird. Are they definitely the two best players in those positions? They're both good signings. I like De Ligt. I like Masraoui. They're both good players, but it's not a great look that you now now have five of that Ajax team at Old Trafford, and presumably that's only does Lasse Schoener turn them down. Um, the Part of me thinks you look at Man United squad and... You go through it and you think, yeah, all right, once everyone's fit, if they can get everybody fit, you have Luke Shaw's a great left back and Masraoui's a, a really high quality right back. You've got De Ligt and Martinez and or Lenny Yoro in, in defence. Kobe Mainu, what a, what a season this will be for him, like the, the great breakout star of last season. Bruno Fernandes. You've got Rashford, John Nacho, Jaden Sancho's back and seems to be kind of back in the fold. Hoyland, Xerxes there to give him a bit of cover and support. You kind of think, yeah, actually, do you know what? That's a really good team. That's a, a good team and a good squad. And at the same time, you think, mm, it's not that different to last year. And they finished eighth. And I'm not quite sure which of those two, those two futures. I don't think they've signed any players particularly who are transformational. Maybe De Ligt, if he kind of recaptures his, his Ajax form, maybe. But... I think the best the best hope for United, to be perfectly honest, is that Mainu and Garnacho continue their kind of effervescent development. They continue to hit the stratosphere, and you might happen upon a team that can compete. Whether that's got anything to do with Eric Ten Hag or not, I don't really. To be honest, I don't really know. Will he survive the season? 
I think you probably have to say yes at this stage. They they thought about sacking him basically every week. Last season, they didn't. They thought about replacing him in the summer. They didn't. They gave him a new contract. They've signed two players he knows and likes. They seem to be committed to him, which is an astonishing turnaround. But, you know, maybe it'll work. God bless. I do feel for him. I feel his pain. I feel his confusion. He feels like Ned Stark, honestly. I talked about Harren Hall earlier. He feels like Ned Stark lost in King's Landing. Um, but enough Manchester United. We have to talk about a club I, I don't even pretend to understand anymore. Chelsea Football Club. Um, a season that ended with, let's remember this, positivity, the feeling of momentum, uh, Cole Palmer excelling. And constantly making the very complex look very, very simple. Uh, Marlo Gusto summoning a menace. Mark Kukurea excelling at the Euros. Christopher Nkunku recovering and being back. But then Pochettino left after telling pretty well everyone when you look back at it uh, that this was not his team, even when they were winning. Um, and for the first time I interviewed Pochettino at Chelsea last season, right before the season started, he never truly seemed himself. He never uh, uh, admitted he was fully in control. You, you felt a, a sense of doubt uh, from the very beginning of his time, honestly, in control of this project. It, um, it was never fully his idea of football, never fully his squad. And in comes young bald Enzo Maresca, man who got Leicester promoted last season. He's never coached in the top flight in his entire career. Uh, he's part of the pep coaching tree like Mikel Arteta. Um, I met him last week in Atlanta. Spent um, a bunch of time with him. Uh, he is so bright. He's very charming. Um, he sees football. Um, he's a chess aficionado. He sees football as almost identical to chess, to lightning chess, which is amazing to discuss and wrap your head around. Um, his preseason, honestly, has seemed like a work in progress, especially defensively, trying to play the ball out the back. Um, it's honestly been at times like watching a baby giraffe take its first steps. But man, Raw, I don't understand Chelsea. I don't know um, if anyone does. American investors clearly took over. They spent $1.4 billion on 28 senior players, which is total flux. Um, I was told by sources at the club, um, that they did this because they thought they might get a transfer ban dating back to the Abramovich days, so they had no choice. But this chaos has continued this summer. 12 summer signings, big one being $69 million wall speed for Pedro Neto. Tabloid talk of nine players still to clear out. Um, I feel for Maresca a little bit. He staked his career here to this club. He's bright, um, but no manager. Uh, may understand the intricacies of the Sicilian defence better than him, but I'm not sure that will be enough here amidst this chaos. Raw, can anyone preside over this chaos of player dealings? Almost as if they're trying to create order uh, amidst an avalanche of a locker room. It's a madness. Yeah, I, I think it's re getting increasingly hard even for perfectly eloquent, like erudite Chelsea fans to actually explain the thinking behind what they're doing. The there may still be a transfer ban coming. Maybe they're, they're worried about that, so they're stockpiling. You could just about make the case that what they're trying to do is take a kind of baseball approach. I saw this on either X or Threads. I can't remember which one it was. That basically they're, they're, they're assuming that if you treat all of these kind of random Brazilian teenagers they're signing as number one draft picks, that if you accumulate enough of them and they develop as they should, then you win all the time, every time. The problem, obviously, is that they don't all develop as they should, and that if you sign all of them at the same time, they're getting in each other's way. There's very clearly no pathway. Chelsea do have a, you know, a, a team in its network, Strasbourg. That's not gone especially well. They don't want Chelsea's cast-offs. They have their own ideas, their own kind of agency, their own in intent of what they, they think they need, um, and their own problems to solve. You know, they're in a different league. They've got a, they're at a different level. They're not a feeder team. You shouldn't be using a club any club but you know a club like Strasbourg which is a you know a proper historic well established football team you can't be using them as a feeder team it doesn't work because the, the people around that club will deeply resent it um i don't understand what chelsea are doing there is one interpretation which is just that these are basically these are americans they're baseball guys they they're trying to do something that just doesn't work in football ha 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 aren't they stupid i don't think that's true i don't think they are stupid i don't think it's possible that they're stupid i think they might be taking a reckless gamble on something they don't fully understand that's not the same as being stupid um i think more likely is that they have a plan which is to basically 
create a club that is that has such a critical mass of playing talent that they occupy an outsized role in the transfer market itself. And I'm not sure how I feel about that. I think it's probably quite bad for football as a whole. I mentioned that uh, on on various platforms in, in the relatively recent past and got quite a lot of um, abuse from Chelsea fans who laughed at... One of whom laughed at the concept of football as a whole, but someone kind of needs to think about that a bit. I, I don't see how it works. I mean, Chelsea will potentially do... Moresh is a really good manager... All the players they've signed are really talented. There's no there's no shortage of ability at Chelsea. But when you've got that many players and the ones who are already there don't really want to be forced out, they're all on massively long contracts. They've got all of the kind of control. I just don't see what... I, it doesn't, what Chelsea are doing doesn't make any sense. And there's a point where you can look at a, a kind of traditional, conservative, vaguely reactionary market like football and say, I'm I'm the cleverest person in the room. I'm going to disrupt it. And sometimes it works. And there's sometimes the reason football does things is because football has learned over 130 years that's the best way to do things. And you come along and disrupt it, and the only person you really disrupt is yourself. Oh, sounds like an incredible uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers album, Disrupt Yourself. Um, it is like playing Monopoly against someone who just is trying to buy every single property uh, that they land on. Um, it is a... It also like the old story about, you know, American investors in Hollywood being like, you know, uh, why do we make movies that are just bombs? Why don't we only make hits? Um, ultimately, youth development doesn't work like that. It's the most erratic thing uh, that is possible. And watching them repeat last summer has been uh, for many, many Chelsea fans, just a sense of curdling that they've they've lost control of their club. One of the most fascinating things about being over here is seeing how Todd Burley has just become the poster boy for just terrible decision making. Um, he's not even that uh, involved in the club's senior decision making anymore, but it's his face that's still uh, at the back of every <laughs> single um, tabloid. Anytime they make a move, it's like, Burley does it again. He's become almost the face of just... Um, just ill-informed American ownership uh, decision-making, a bit like Xerox is just the name for every single photocopy or, or Band-Aid is just the name for every single plaster that's wrapped around a finger. The one thing I would say on that is that, yeah, Bowley's not involved in, in, in transfers as he was, you know, in that brief spell when they first took over. But I think he and Clear Lake and Ed Barley and the people who run the club they have to take responsibility for the strategy. You know, the, the many, many sporting directors that Chelsea have, it's only two now, but, you know, they, they're they not <laughs> acting outside of... They're not kind of... They've not gone rogue. It's not like the kind of Lawrence Stewart and Paul Wynne Stanley have gone like, right, we're going to do this, even if the even if the suits in the office, in the in head office don't like it, we're going to go and sign Aaron Anselmi for 26 million euros. Like, they are they are acting on instructions. There is clearly some sort of idea here and it would be interesting to know whether what that idea is what the logic behind it is because I'm, I'm not convinced we've been given a full answer to that can i just hope enzo moresca get some time he will need it um another big change at chelsea prepare yourself america michaelo mudrick has shorn off his locks yes he's gone full top boy it's the season of the ball baby on sunday chelsea opened the campaign at home against Manchester City. Pray for Enzo, people. Um, let's talk about some of the other interesting new characters that stand out in this season of wonder to come. Newcastle team somewhat in flux at the ownership level. Uh, Amanda Staveley uh, and Murad Godusi, the figureheads of the takeover, of the Saudi takeover. It's driving force. It's impetus. Uh, the camera cut away to them every time Newcastle scored a goal uh, for the last couple of seasons. They'd left uh, over the summer. Financial fair play rules have really stymied the growth of the squad. Front office changes too. Uh, Manchester United plucked Dan Ashworth to be their sporting director. Um, lot of change, a lot of pressure for Eddie Howe. Another club in transition. Can't wait to watch new Brighton boss Fabian Herzler, who's arrived to replace Roberto De Zerbi. Um, Herzl is 31 years old. He's a baby. Uh, he steered St. Pauli to the Bundesliga second tier title last term. He came in and described himself, wait for it, as the grounded one. 
Um, it's going to be remarkable to witness him. Um, remember, uh, we had the Brighton CEO, Paul Barber, come on our show and say, the day you start thinking of who your next manager will be is the day your new manager signs his contract. It is, it is an utterly remarkable thing uh, to witness this campaign uh, under Herzl. A Fulham enter the Emil Smith row era, the young Arsenal prodigy deemed surplus to Emirates requirements. So much to prove. The Cottagers suddenly shorn of the man bun of Tim Ream and the defensive shield of this Paulinha. Now of Bayern Munich's manner, Brentford have a tasty new striker, Igor Thiago, on a club record $39 million deal, 23-year-old Brazilian. Feels like a clinical Ivan Tony replacement in the making, even though it actually looks like Ivan Tony may be going nowhere. Wolves will be a work in progress. They've lost Max Kilman and Pedro Neto. They've recruited their usual shoal of intriguing new talents, including young Norwegian target man Jorgen Strand Larsen in from Celta Vigo. Forest, my God, that team crave a year of obscure mid-table mediocrity after their own transfer chaos and points deduction brinkmanship and self-sabotage of seasons past of the new boys, Southampton and Leicester City. Now under sexy's back, Steve Cooper, they're old friends. But Raw, we're going to talk about new boys, Ipswich. What a stunning story they are. A Wrexham light rise for this grand old club from agricultural Suffolk in the eastern rump of England, 22 years away from the big time for a grand old team. Um, A nadir of four years in League One. Um, They opened the season against Liverpool on Saturday, which is a magical return for the American-owned Ed Sheeran shirt-sponsored wonder. Squad, to me, feels a little championship light, almost as if they've risen up too quickly and the foundations haven't quite built along with them. Um, Although the club's CEO, Mark Ashton, um, is a genius in terms of shaping the vision, their reality. Squad still feels thin. Need a midfielder to play alongside their own Egyptian king, Sam Morsey. Um, But their manager is their everything. I cannot wait to see this man. Kieran McKenna, another young man, 38-year-old genius. um, Wanted in the off-season by Chelsea, Manchester United and Brighton. Uh, Actually seemed to be tempted by the big time, but then re-signed with the one who brought him to the big dance. Ipswich Town. He'll be their key. Um, Well, give us a blast on this man. Uh, Because he is remarkable. What is it about him that made him so instantly coveted everywhere? Well, I I go back to to when I first became aware of Kieran McKenna, which was when he was um, an assistant at Manchester United. And he was cast as being almost like a doody hauser of of (laughs) football, but one that we all hated. I can't remember if we were allowed to like doody hauser or not. Was he the hero or the villain? We loved him. There was this sense that he was too young. He was probably a bit nerdy. He wasn't. He wasn't a kind of grizzled ex-player who we'd all heard of. He, you know, if you compare, funnily enough, if you compare the the response that Ruud van Nistelrooy had returning to Manchester United as an assistant to to kind of the way that that Kieran McKenna was presented, it's very different. And he took the the really brave step after what was probably quite a scarring experience at United for all that it was, you know, important educationally, of going to Ipswich in League One, the third tier. And immediately had this kind of transformative effect on a club that has been really drifting for a long time, initially partly because of ownership issues. Um, they they played this really thrilling, neat, adventurous, really sort of hyper modern style to get promoted, get promo- promoted easily from League One, and then they just they just sort of looked at the Championship and went, yeah, okay, do this. Pretty much the same team, pretty much the same squad, same style of football, exactly the same results. Uh, and they they flew up, and I think all of it basically comes down to McKenna. What what he teaches you almost is that there's a lot of footballers out there who are very talented, and you know for the for the most part, kind of aren't maybe it's not so much the talent that's the problem; it's the consistency, the ability to execute again and again and again and again. And if you give them a really good coach who they're willing to play for, who's got a clear idea of what they want to do. A system that kind of suits what what they are good at, and you know, disguises what they're not great at. Then you have quite a lot of success. And it's there was a point in I guess late May, early June, when it looked like McKenna might leave Ipswich. And I remember finding that prospect as someone who has absolutely no stake in like the general health of Ipswich Town. Um, finding that prospect incredibly depressing because he is the story here. He's the one who has galvanised this whole 
club, this whole town, who has turned Ipswich once again into a Premier League team. I remember the Ipswich team that finished sixth in, in I think, 1999, around then, under George Burley. And it feels to me like Ipswich deserve another go at the Premier League. It's a, it, They are a Premier League team from my my youth, so I'm, I'm glad to see them back. It It is all basically down to McKenna. If he'd gone... I think this would have been a really dark and quite depressing campaign for Ipswich. <laughs> With him there, you just wonder. You do just wonder anything is possible um, for this team who deserve every joy. I have to acknowledge uh, my producer uh, and great friend, producer Jay Dubs. Uh, like so many of you probably listening to this, Ipswich is rural, uh, the rump, as I said, of the nation, but it's also um, part of Britain, where there are so many U.S. Uh, historic uh, air bases littered, um, and there's so many um, a strain of American football fan who who were based over there, whose parents were over there, uh, military brats who fell in love with football uh, through Ipswich Town. Uh, producer J. Dubs has a kid, uh, Finn, um, who's just coming of age, just starting to watch the football. Has only seen an Ipswich on the rise. Uh, my heart is giddy. Thinking about them watching this season, whatever happens together will be indelibly uh, embedded in his memory and probably so many uh, young Americans who uh, who served uh, over there in remarkable ways and Godspeed to all of them. It's a beautiful American Anglo connection and I, I revere it and have a real soft spot for that club. Um, we are poised to pick our top four and bottom three roars, uh, but a quick word on Everton Football Club who might just be, say it ain't so, one of the teams in that latter category. Um, we've already mentioned Amadou Onana decamping for Aston Villa. Manchester United have been making eyes at Jared Brantwaite forever. Um, however, new signing centre-back, Jake O'Brien. Um, he's almost a picture him as if Tarkovsky uh, and Jared Brantwaite had a bastard Irish offspring. Um, and Jordan Pickford. Uh, he is going to be our everything, I believe, as has been honestly the case for the past forever. Uh, Jordan Pickford will be our Lord and Saviour. Yes, I, a grown man, am pinning my hopes on the shoulders of a gent who has the words, get the rave on, embossed on his football boots. This will be the club's last ever season in our old Fenway Park of a home under 32-year-old Goodison Park. So many memories um, so many generations, so much spilt beer, so many tears. One thing I take solace in, um, Manchester. this is amazing, Manchester United's pre-season schedule, uh, they flew 13,000 miles. They played in Norway, Scotland, and across the United States. Chelsea and Spurs, I think they both racked up 12,000 miles. Everton had just one fixture outside of the United Kingdom, and that was in the Republic of Ireland. I think we kept every other game within 200 miles of Goodison Park. Very old school. God bless. Uh, Sean Deitch, very, very worried um, about global warming, clearly. That must be the only reason. Um, honestly, there's talk over the last couple of days, I crap you not, of a third point deduction for Everton for financial irregularities. We're honestly getting to the point where we're just the mill house of the Premier League. Why always us? I have no idea. Rory, what is dead may never die. Looking externally, calmly at Everton from the outside, Rory, is our best hope the clearly magical quasi-religious tracksuit that Sean Dyche wore so effectively to save the club down the stretch last season? We don't have much else, do we? So, I'm not sure Everton need to be particularly worried. I, I think, you know, there might be another points deduction. That's possible. I don't think it will be on the scale of of the first one they got last season, because there's an element of what triple jeopardy about it. Like you're still being punished for the accounts you've already been punished for, and I think the Premier League would take that into account. Um, but if you take those points that they lost, that they were docked away, they finished mid-table. And yep, Sean Dyche's methods aren't pretty. There was a period between what November and April when they did not win a single game, or score a goal, or get any points. And yet somehow they rose up the table to 14th. Um, they will do enough. I think they've made two quite smart signings in Undii from Marseille uh, and Jesper Lindstrom from, on loan from Napoli. Um, I think that adds a little bit to their, to their resources. I think they could do with a couple more if that's possible. But as ever, the big question with it for Everton is not who they sign. It is not how many points the Premier League d deduct them. It is who on earth is going to own the club 
because the Freetons are no longer there. There is this issue of the debt to 777 and the people who provide 777 with the money. That is still a mess. Farhad Mashiri is still there. He is still in he is still in control of the club. There are other people interested, which is good. I think John Texter came out relatively recently and said that he was back in the race. One of these days, I'm going to go, go go public and say I'm back in the race for something. I don't know what it'll be, but it's going to be great. <laughs> um, the the most important thing that can happen for Everton is that the season ends with them in some spot between like I don't know twelfth oh, and seventeenth. Oh my god. And Farhad Mashiri is a thing of the past. My God, that that is the promised land. Um, and we are almost at our own promised land in this podcast. One more quick question before we get to the winners and the losers of the season ahead. It's a raven from Frank from Kennebunk, Maine. A great GFOP who wrote, um, Roger and Rory, it's almost Christmas morning for football fans. A time of hope and dreams and anticipation um, with the Premier League about to crash upon us i was wondering which single team do you think will exceed all expectations like aston villa last year perhaps overachieving to win a a champions league spot hint could it please be crystal palace which teams do you think are most likely to be uh that team let me know your thoughts frank from maine Crystal Palace supporter. Palace very much all about Oliver Glasner, the manager, continuing his new manager bounce, which is honestly intellectually sensational. Uh, they've lost the Lise. They've kept old Aze so far. Also Gwehi so far. And that seems unlikely that they'll be playing for them, or at least one of them, uh, come the Premier League start of the season. Adam Water will have to continue his revelation campaign. Raw, which club do you believe will overachieve this season and thrill us Unai Emery star. To be honest, I think if Palace keep Eze and Gay, although I don't think they'll keep Gay, uh, I think it might be them because their form at the end of last season was so astonishing. There won't be another Villa. There's there's the, the likeliest kind of team to crash the Champions League spots who's not either in the in the traditional bid six or Aston Villa is probably Newcastle, and they were in the Champions League two seasons ago, so that's not exactly a shock. I think that kind of top eight will probably remain in place, and the order will start with Manchester City, and it will probably end with one of Newcastle or Villa. That'll be the one to eight balance. And in the middle of that, it's kind of... some. You know, Chelsea might be better than we think, or worse than we think. Liverpool might be better than we think, or worse than we think, or whatever. But none of them are really shocks, are they? I would say for the teams that are going for kind of finishing ninth as being the highest they can aim for, Palace aren't a bad bet, and that would be it. Maybe wouldn't be a massive surprise, but I think it would be something we should um, we should praise and admire and encourage. You just made a man in Maine very very happy. I actually believe West Ham are super intriguing. Um, yes. Uh, gambling's Lucas Paqueta may not receive a ban this season and could play and will thrive under new manager Julian Lopetegui. Um, you may remember him, Wolves fans, as your bland turtleneck aficionado slash tactical genius. Um, incoming players, also intriguing, Crescenzo Somerville for a reported uh, 34 million initial fee that will rise uh, with games, but also Nicholas Fulkrug, essentially German Hodor, um, an instant cult hero for the Premier League. Uh, the, sadly, and ironically, says Alanis Morissette, the ultimate David Moyes striker arriving the summer. The Moisey has left us. Uh, but it is time for you, Roars, to spoiler alert the Premier League story with me. Let's start with the forces of darkness and misery. Why not? Um, Who will fall through the moon door of relegation? Which three teams will be to the Premier League what Ray Gunn is to break dancing. I think relegation might be quite interesting this season because Ipswich, logically, I, want, I kind of want to say Ipswich and Southampton will go straight back down. But they both have very, very good managers. They've got McKenna, who we've talked about, but also Russell Martin at Southampton, who's someone I think we, people will become a lot more aware of this season, is really, really promising, a really bright, adventurous, quite ideologically kind of secure manager. So I don't think you'd, you'd guarantee either of them. Leicester have enough nous and Premier League experience in their squad, even with Steve Cooper coming in, to be to be competitive. 
it was always a bit of a misno, a, a bit of a kind of glitch in the matrix that they went down in the first place. And then there's a few who you look at: Bournemouth, Forest, Wolves, who might struggle. I'm discounting Everton as they will survive. It won't be pretty, but they will. So I think I might plump four: Southampton, Leicester, and Wolves to get relegated. God bless! I come out very differently. For me, Leicester City, uh, who ran away with the championship last year, um, but I believe they're going to Burnley the season up with. Outstar Kin and Dewsbury Hall and that ball cranium manager Enzo Maresca, um, a possible punishment for financial irregularities also looming. Um, I agree with you on Southampton, a dodgy goalkeeper and a blunt up top uh, depth chart is not a good combo. Uh, but bottom of your table, 2024-25 will be Everton Football Club. Uh, contractually obliged to speak out my worst outcome so as to protect myself from it and manage my own expectations and worst fears. Oh, a trick as old as time. To the top four, the promised land. Which teams will make their fans' hearts sore, Rory? Fourth place, Liverpool. Third place, and this is tough. Third place, I... I, I kind of think Manchester United, but do you know what? I think it might be Villa. I think Villa might might go one better. So I'm going to say Aston Villa. God bless you. Keep going. Don't stop now, baby. Second place, Arsenal. First place, sorry, Manchester City. Oh, oh my God. This is like the worst sequel. It's like Police Academy 5. Um, I, I think fourth place. I'm not quite sure if I believe this or if I'm just trying to say it so that nice things happen. In a time of global darkness, I think it's probably the latter. Fourth place, Tottenham Hotspur. Good on you, Big Ange, mate. Third place, I agree with you. Aston Bloody Villa. Unai Emery uh, and Monchi, the sporting director. What an incredible coup for uh, an American-run team. Wes Eden's remarkable. Um, the Milwaukee Bucks owner. Um, a really sophisticated... Sports owner, it is remarkable to witness what they're doing. Second, oh, as it was hard to hear it, it breaks my heart even more to say it, Raw, because I wish it would be different. But second place for the third season in a row, Arsenal Football Club. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you've still got the best shirts in football, guys. Um, and top of the table, um, Manchester City, uh, it's the five peat. And probs just as importantly, I believe you'll just be fined for the 115 charges. Um, and that's that. We've just saved you a lot of lot of viewing time. Use your football time just as family time instead. Rose and I have told you what's going to happen, so you don't need to watch it. So, Raw, let's finish off with one big, bold, hairy prediction for this season ahead from your creative mind. Well, so there's kind of two. One is... I think people will quite like the new Champions League format. That That is a form of change that I think will be popular when when people accept that some changes are, you know, not terrible. And the second is, I, I wonder whether a major league in Europe, possibly the Premier League, possibly not, will have a fairly sustained motion to abolish VAR. Oh, say a tiny bit more, baby. Well, it's happened in... Sweden have, 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 um, have never introduced it. Norway, I think, are pushing to abolish it. And I just wonder whether one of the leads somewhere, one of the big five, might... If you got kind of a Luis Diaz against Spurs kind of situation again, whether there might be enough of a groundswell of support now for people to say, actually, look, enough's enough. You know, we saw Wolves come out against VAR towards the end of last season they they petitioned the premier league to to have a have a vote on whether it should should be retained i wonder whether whether there is now so, it's so unpopular people dislike it so intensely i just think it's possible that you you might get close to one of the major leagues about saying look we we are prepared to consider abolishing it and once one of them does i think quite a few might God bless. Rise up, workers, and smash 
the machinery that threatens to replace you. You know, I don't love to make predictions. Um, I do believe, honestly, this is the greatness of football to me. That the only uh, thing that is for sure at the beginning of a new season is that football will find some way to make a fool out of all of us. Um, but this um, weekend will be the first game of football I will ever watch in my lifetime, um, in which Everton will play, uh, and that my dad will not be alive to share it with me. Um, as I told you, when my the, my dad was buried, the second his coffin uh, was placed into the earth, uh, my oldest son turned to me uh, with solace, trying to find a beautiful thing to say to me in a time of human darkness. He just turned around to me, and what came out of his mouth was, at least Grandpa never got to see Everton play outside of the Premier League in his lifetime, which was which was the sweetest and and, and and silliest thing and all the more beautiful because of both uh, in reality. I pray that remains the case for some time. Narrator's voice, it won't. Uh, but my point is to all of you listeners, just savour all of this. Um, this weekend is the only one of the season in which all of us, no matter whom we support, can dream and revel and magical think. Brace yourselves. Honestly, all of our teams will soar. All of our teams will plummet at different times. Um, we will all experience the gauntlet of every human emotion known um, to us. And that's the true gift of the game. Raw, I raise my glass to the sense of connection that we have to each other through football as this spectacle unfurls. Um, and also to the cross-generational memories that we forge you along the way. It's been beautiful. Uh, salivating like Pavlov's dog alongside of you uh, as we think about this season. You're a beautiful human being and I can't wait to unpack it all with you. Well, this is the thing now. Now I'm thinking, do you know what? I am quite sort of emotionally invested in whether walls might collapse. That's the thing. It always, there's something that gets you. I, I want to know how, you know, which of the three changing rooms at Chelsea Pedro Neto gets to go in. <laughs> like, there's just all these questions to be answered. Just... And I'm quite... Quite when you is, is Ryan Sessegnon a good footballer? I think he's a good footballer. I've not seen him play football for several oh years, but is it is could he be the man who transforms Fulham? You just don't God, know. God, how just at the end of the show you drop that incredible philosophical question on all of us, and we're all hooked. We are all anticipating. We are all finally ready. And to all of you, save it every second. Let's not take watching football together for granted. It's Rog saying big, big love. Here from London, I'll be back in America uh, for El Grande kickoff. We'll podcast right afterwards. Big love to you. Courage.